Part 1 Megan and Ken are deciding how they will spend the evening. You have some time to look at questions 1 to 7 now. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 7. Hello, Megan speaking. Hello, Megan. Hello, Ken. I'm glad you called. Thomas asked me to give you his telephone number. Is that his office number or his home number? I can give you both. His new home number is 9452-3456. Would you like his office number? I think I have it. Does 97314322 sound right? That's it. But the home number is 94523456. He moved in last week. Good. I've got that. Now, what would you like to do? Well, I'd like to go dancing, but Jane's hurt her ankles, so she'd rather not. That's a pity. I guess it means she doesn't want to play tennis either. That's right. She says it's OK to go bowling if we don't expect her to do well. OK, let's do it. I guess we can go dancing some other time. Well, I booked us some time at the bowling alley of Entertainment City. Do you know it? Is it on Smith Street? Down near the university? That's right. It's on the corner of Smith Street and Bridge Road. What time did you book for? The first booking I could get was 8 o'clock. OK. It's 7 now. What do you want to do first? Well, I think we should leave now. We can meet at the bowling alley. I can't be that quick. I have to call Thomas to start with, and I need to get changed. OK. I think I'll leave in ten minutes and meet you in there. That makes sense. I'll take my car, so I'll be quite quick. I'll be out of here in half an hour. OK. You're so lucky to have a car. You can get around so easily. Well, yes and no. I often spend ages driving around trying to find a park. The traffic can be very bad. Well, that won't be a problem for me, because I'll take the bus. It goes right past my door, and I'll have plenty of time. Sounds good. Who else is coming? I think nearly everyone from the afternoon class will be there. Which class? The big maths class or the afternoon tutorial? The maths class. What's more, we get a concession for large numbers. That's good. I'm trying to keep my expenses down this month. So am I. I expect tonight will cost about $20. You must be good with money. I expect it to come to, hmm, nearly $40. So how are you going to manage that? Well, the bus is cheap, and if I come home early, I won't have time to spend too much. In any case, I have to be up early tomorrow morning, so I'd really better try to get home by about 11. That reminds me. I have to phone the taxi company for my mother. Goodbye, Megan. I'll see you later. Goodbye, Ken. Ken calls the taxi company. First, look at questions 8 and 9.
Thank you for calling Acme Cabs. Please follow the instructions on the tape. If you wish to order a cab now, press 1. If you have placed an order previously, press 2. If you wish to make an advance order, press 3. Please be ready to tell us your street number and name. If you wish to speak to the radio room supervisor, press 4. If you want to inquire about lost property, press 5. If you want to order a taxi equipped to carry wheelchairs, press 6. Your call is very important. Please stay on the line for the next available order taker. Hello. I think I left something in one of your cabs on Thursday. It was a brown paper package with an address written on it in green ink. Has anyone handed it in? That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the education officer in a museum giving a talk to school students who are about to start a one-week work placement in the museum. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning and welcome. We're really pleased that you're going to be joining us next week for your work placement. Now, each of you will already have met the member of museum staff assigned to supervise you. In this short talk today, I'll be giving you more general information which will be relevant to all six of you. Your normal working day is 9 to 5 p.m., but on Monday, because it's your first day, we'd like you to arrive at quarter to nine. Please note, though, that you'll finish at the usual time. A lot of you have been asking what you should wear for work. Well, you may have noticed that we're not exactly a formal institution, so you'd really be out of place if you wear smart attire like a suit. If you go out on a trip with us, then we'd like you to wear a museum cap. It has our logo on, and we feel it helps people recognise you. But on a day-to-day -day basis in the museum itself, we say put on your own casual clothing because you'll be doing lots of dusty, messy work. Now... We don't have an enormous number of rules, but work placement is an excellent preparation for the real world of work, and we expect you to be very punctual and reliable. If you're not well, or there's been a hold-up, then what we ask you to do is ring the museum receptionist. He will be in the museum well ahead of opening time, and he'll inform your own personal supervisor in the museum. If you're away for more than one day, we'll inform your school tutor. They'll obviously need to make a note of your absence and follow up if necessary. But most of all, we hope you really enjoy yourselves during the placement. Students say they have a lot of fun, whether it's working with kids in our art workshops held every Monday or, the most popular, when they go out on our outreach work to residential homes, recording elderly people's memories of school days for our oral history project. So, we hope you feel excited by the prospect of starting next week and well prepared. Your personal supervisor will be there to help you with our health and safety requirements when you start next week. 
and your supervisors will also brief you about the background to the museum, summarising all the huge amount of information on our website. In the next couple of days, it might be worthwhile if you get hold of evaluations and other notes made by students who've worked with us before. You can get a lot of pointers from them. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, before I finish today, I wanted to help you find your way around the museum. When you start next Monday, the first thing you'll need to do is sign in. Come through the main entrance and you'll see the main staircase straight ahead. To the right of this is the statue of the horse and just behind that is a door. Go through that and that's the sign-in office. Now, on the first day, you'll be working in Gallery 1. You'll find this as follows. In the central courtyard area, close to the entrance, there's a large chest where visitors put donations for the museum. The door just behind that leads to Gallery 1. The workshop you'll be taking part in starts at 11, but if you want to go in earlier, you can get the key and let yourself in. The key box is quite hard to find. Walk behind reception and it's between the large gallery and the bookshop. I haven't mentioned breaks, um, lunch, etc. Unfortunately, our cafe's closed at the moment, so your best bet is to bring a packed lunch. We tend to have our sandwiches in the kitchen area. Go round the reception desk and you'll see a small circular cabinet. The door to the kitchen area is just behind that. Now, every day we put up notices about what's happening in the museum. Your supervisor will brief you, but if you want to check up on details, look on our staff notice board. This is in the corner of the play area at the back, on the wall of Gallery 3. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to help. That is the end of Part 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a radio program in which the speakers discuss the importance of looking after old people in winter. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 24. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 24. Now listen and answer the questions. Nobody likes cold weather, but for old people it can be particularly uncomfortable and dangerous. They can become cold without even noticing it. To keep warm, they may need help from friends and neighbors like you. To find out how we can help, we've invited a representative from the Social Service Department at the Town Hall to talk about the Winter Warmth Code campaign. 
Mr. Hastings, can I first ask you why it is so important to keep an eye on elderly people during cold weather such as we've been having lately? Yes. There are two main reasons. First, the old suffer from the cold more than the rest of us. They're not as active or strong as you and me, and it's harder for them to keep warm. This can lead to all sorts of complications. They have less resistance to infection. The quality of their lives is badly affected, and in extreme cases, they may need to be hospitalized. According to the newspapers, old people are actually dying of the cold. Is this true? I'm afraid it is. I said before there were two main reasons why we should keep an eye on old people. Well, the other major problem is that so many pensioners cannot afford to heat their homes properly. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 25 to 30. They may already be living in difficult circumstances. Then, in an exceptionally cold winter such as this one, they may just not have enough money to pay for the extra heating necessary. It seems terrible that in a society such as ours this should be happening. It is. And what the Winter Warmth Code campaign aims to do is to bring this problem to the attention not only of the government, but of everybody else in society. We all have a duty towards our old people to make sure that they do not suffer in this cold weather. So now to the practical side of things. What can we do to help? Well, we all know someone old, a relative maybe, a neighbor, someone living round the corner. We should adopt that person and make sure that we spare a few minutes every day to check that everything is okay. Make sure, even if the old person is not actually ill, that he or she is not suffering. Check when you go inside that the house or flat doesn't feel cold to you. It's a good idea to try to feel some part of their body, like their face or hands. Old people can become cold without even noticing it, you know. Okay. And if a person is too poor to afford to heat the house or flat? The best thing, then, is for the old person to live in one room only and to make sure that that one room is warm. Check that the bed is on an inside wall. Move it yourself if necessary. Check the room for drafts. A lot of cold air gets into the room through old windows or badly fitting doors. Is food important? Yes. Make sure that the old person is eating well. You could help by cooking for them or doing the shopping. Remember, a good hot meal a day makes a big difference. Also, make sure that they are well dressed. Old people need to wear more layers of clothes than we do, particularly at night. One last question, Mr. Hastings. Is there nothing the state can do to help? Oh, yes, indeed. Contact your town hall to find out about local organizations already involved in this kind of work. If there is a local Meals on Wheels service, for instance, you could get your adopted old person on the list. Then, of course, there are also many state benefits which an old person could be entitled to and which he or she doesn't know about, and which therefore he or she is not claiming. An extra problem here is that it can often be complicated, and old people don't like going to Social Security offices to fill in forms and all that. You can help by finding out for them what possibilities exist for claiming a little extra money from the government, then applying for it for them. That little extra could make all the difference. Yes, indeed. Well, Mr. Hastings, thank you for coming in and talking to us today. Thank you.
That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk about security in the UK. Listen to the talk and complete the statements below. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In large cities, for instance London, and crowded places such as airports and stations, there is the risk of theft. We do not want you to suffer the distress of losing important documents and valuables as soon as you step onto British soil. So here are some important do's and don'ts. Don't carry more cash than you need for daily expenses. If you stay at a hotel, do ask the manager to keep large sums of cash, documents, and valuables in the hotel safe and give you a receipt for them. This is a free service. If cash is stolen, it is very unlikely to be recovered. Do keep separately a note of the serial numbers on your traveller's checks, so if they are lost, you can inform your bank. Do take particular care of bank and credit cards. Do carry wallets and purses in an inside pocket or a handbag. Don't ever leave a bag unattended, and make sure it is securely fastened when you are carrying it. Do carry jewellery and valuables such as cameras, radios, and typewriters on you or with you, and keep a note of any serial numbers. Do take special care of your passport, travel tickets, and other important documents. Documents are at risk, particularly at airports and stations. Where it is obvious that most people will be carrying them, do make a note and keep it in a safe place of the number of your passport, its date, and place of issue. This makes replacement easier if you are unlucky enough to lose it. If you don't want to carry heavy luggage around with you, you can leave it in a luggage office at most large stations and pick it up later. Keep the receipt so that you can reclaim your luggage. Check the opening hours, or you may find your luggage locked away when you need it again. If you lose any of your luggage in transit, take this up immediately with the officials of the airline or shipping line. But don't worry too much. Ninety-eight percent is found within three days. If you lose anything, go first to the lost property office at the airport or station, as it may have been found and handed in. If you lose your luggage in the street. Or suspect it has been stolen rather than gone astray. Find the nearest policeman who will advise you what to do. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answer.